Now, what I would like to begin to share with you is a series of things on this uh, issue that sort of presents how. How are they going to do it? Now, one of the things that we'll start showing, if you want to, for a moment, if you can provide, you know, this is the authorization for the study that's due in June. And then I want to show you a series of things. So let's look at this for a moment. This is a very interesting case. Cash Landrum, you probably have all heard of it. This was actually a extraterrestrial vehicle that was being test flown by four humans out of the Nevada test range. And this we have from an Air Force intelligence guy who is the principal investigator. You'll see his clip later talking about the fact that he debriefed the pilots of this and what happened. As you know, the people underneath this object when it was out of control were irradiated and were extremely and very sick, had to be hospitalized. One of the famous cases in 1980. Now what happened is that when this occurred, they couldn't get the extraterrestrial energy power plant to work. So they put on, foolishly, a nuclear, portable nuclear power plant on this thing. And they were test flying it out of the Nevada test range, Area 51. By the way, nobody calls it that, but people don't know what's out there. And it was being flown to a, a base in Texas. It went out of control outside of Houston, Huffman, Texas, I believe it was. And it came down and irradiated and actually irradiated the land there. It actually, that whole road had to be repaved clandestinely. Now, the public was left to believe this was, you know, the aliens came down and poisoned everybody. Or they, they didn't say, they were happy for people to reach and leap to these conclusions. In reality, this, we have now proof and testimony from the principal investigator for the Air Force who debriefed the four pilots on this, humans. And that object, my friend, was test flown by humans, but it was extraterrestrial. So this is a hybrid case where you have an extraterrestrial air form and systems, but the power energy system, they couldn't quite get to work. They put this a nuclear power plant on it. It had a filter or some, some problem where it malfunctioned, sort of spewing this stuff uh, out to these poor victims who have never been compensated. In fact, the case went to court. The judge threw it out because the government said, we don't know what this is. We had nothing to do with it. But the truth is they weren't lying. The government, the government, people talk about the government, which government? Who in the government? The nature of an unacknowledged special access project like this is that if the Secretary of Defense doesn't know about it and the director of the CIA isn't read into it and they're lying to the president about it, do you think the public information officer or the case officer for an Air Force base near Houston is going to know what the hell this was? No. So they're not lying. This is plausible deniability because since they don't know, they can testify under oath, this wasn't ours. We know nothing about this. Now we know for a fact, and we have the recorded video testimony of the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, uh, principal investigator on this, Richard Doty, who is a master of disinformation in his career, but is coming clean on some of this. Next. We're gonna go through a series of, oh, well, maybe not. Okay, oh, I thought it was just gonna be a slide one after another. Um, so next year, what we're gonna see or a series of schematics and cases of over the years, uh, very interesting. This is 1956, sort of a domed object with these uh, underneath. This was a, a man-made uh, anti-gravity vehicle uh, from the 50s that was seen. And we can go to the drawing of it. Very good, excellent illustrations. Uh, and you know a very, a very well documented case. I'm going to go through a number of these examples. So next, <laughs> this is one from New Zealand. Our friends from down under. Uh, this was also a man-made object. Uh, the date on this uh, is listed somewhere below there. Um, I believe it's in the 50s. And 
that object, a very well documented case occurred and uh, someone came out and was, it was a human in sort of an astronaut suit. But this, I believe it's 1959. Um, here we are, yeah, Blenheim, New Zealand. It had these flames, so it had a combination of uh, uh, anti-gravity and also other types of uh, energy systems. And people say, oh, this is from New Zealand. I said, oh yeah, 1959, next. So we're gonna run through a bunch of these quickly. Okay, next. This is a really interesting one. Uh, again, the, the dates, this was 1966. Love the Mustang. And this is an object that came in and uh, for some reason landed or malfunctioned. Uh, another early prototype of a man-made uh, electrogravit, meaning anti-gravity, a uh, high voltage system. And it uh, rose up uh, and took off like a spark off a grinder is how it was described. Um, but you can see there's some components of it from conventional aerospace aircraft on the front, the bubble. Uh, but this was, again, it, it sort of had a high drilling whining sound as it took off and was gone. And this is man-made, 1966. Next. And this is very similar to some of the Tic Tac things. Uh, it's a, got an arc on it. Uh, I think this was uh, in, what date was this? This is a uh, 20, uh, well, no, not 2017, that's a, uh, I'm sure of the date. Anyway, uh, but it, a very interesting object, reminiscent of, of some of the Tic Tac and other objects. We have a number of videos of these canister and cylinder objects. This was seen in enough detail. And you can see the rivets, you can see the detail. An extraterrestrial vehicle is seamless, has no parts like that, has no welds, those, when you see those, my friends, those are not extraterrestrial. Those are man-made. And there are a series of generations of these that have been rolled out um, since the 50s operationally. <clears throat> they were studied before then. Next. This is a really interesting one. Um, again, this 1972, so we're talking almost 50 years ago. It uh, looks like a, an iron with this uh, rectangular object on it. Um, that was seen uh, and uh, multiple witnesses. Again, this is a man-made uh, platform, a silent electrogravitic. Next. And this is a really interesting one. This is from the 72. Uh, it has these sort of flaming uh, energy out of the rear of it and a bubble of Another one in front that's man-made. I don't forget which city this was over. Um, yeah, in Venezuela. And people say, really, these other countries? Oh yes, all over the world. I mean, these, these operations are not just out of remote places like Area 51. So they have these facilities all over the world, you know, Alice Springs here and there. Uh, and, all of, and, and they can go anywhere very quickly because they're not using jets and rockets. Because even our most, you know, really extraordinary uh, craft may get to anywhere in the world in a couple hours. These don't take that long. So uh, those have been experimented with in different shapes, forms, and sizes. Many of them are based on re acquired extraterrestrial vehicles that we have shot down and studied and then experimented with the airframe and the propulsion and energy systems, the flaming ellipse. Next. This is an interesting one. Uh, this is from uh, 1980s. I'm just taking you in chronological order, number one. Uh, there are a lot of objects that are sort of rectangular or domed rectangles, totally silent, can float over the landscape. Uh, the, uh, many of the objects we'll get to in a moment and seeing the Hudson Valley back the, in the 80s, 90s. Uh, were those kinds of objects. These are, again, electromagnetogravitics. These are pop culture anti-gravity. And different versions of them, different airframes, different experimental types. And many of them have been deliberately flown over populated areas to prompt a UFO sighting, but make people think that they are the extraterrestrial ones. So you have two things going on simultaneously, actual extraterrestrial vehicles and the ones that are made by clandestine uh, aerospace and uh, 
black budget funding in the unacknowledged special access projects, the deep black world of engineering. Next. I mean, all these cases, each, look, we have hundreds and hundreds, this, is, this would go on for days if we were doing it, but these are very interesting, excellent drawings. Now this case, of course, I was very involved with, um, as you know, this is the Japan, Japan Airlines case of uh, 747 going over Alaska, and we can go up and the pilot had this massive uh, vehicle come forward. This is a real one. Let's look at it. Can you scroll? Flip? No. Hmm. Uh, there's a wonderful schematic of what the pilot saw. It was a large, seamless, almost like walnut shaped object, massive. Um, that was, I guess, to make it into the slide, sorry. That was uh, the Japan Airlines case. That's one of the disclosure witnesses, as you know, was uh, Mr. Callahan. And he was the chief FAA uh, person in charge of accidents and incidents when this occurred during the Reagan years. And he actually has handed to us, and I have, the original radar films, check tracings. Not a copy, the originals, we have them. And the Japan Airlines pilot encountered this object and it would be, you know, the, this part of the sky at one second and a couple sweeps of the radar or one sweep would be in another direction altogether. And the pilot, the Japanese pilot said, described it. It was actually on military radar, on board, visually seen and civilian radar. So this got kicked up to the highest level of the FAA and at that meeting, if you remember the disclosure project, the CIA came in and, and said, we're gonna confiscate all of the data on this. And they had just stacks and stacks of digital data on this case. And so they had to give it up. And Mr. Callahan says, yeah, okay, we'll give it to you. Turns out those were copies. He kept the originals. And when he left the FAA, he took them and we have them. True. Okay, so next. This is a very interesting, a pyramid shaped object. Uh, we have a model similar to this to it here. Um, now this has all kinds of tube and structures on the bottom. And uh, what's interesting, uh, this is 1994, there are extraterrestrial vehicles uh, that are pyramid shaped. But there are also man-made ones that they've made to look like them. So they're copycats. You see what they're doing? So uh, it's like the old commercial. Is it real or is it Memorex? So is this the only way I'm mic'd? So we probably need to have people handing me these, these models. If I can have an assistant there and then hand off here. There you go. Thank you. So here's to, <laughs> thank you. Um, and this is another, this is a great one. I like uh, th this one because we may have, this is also in England, 1990. And this one is great because it has, if you look at the underside, there are the girders and the structures, and they're even weld marks. Now, of course, there's the triangular, and the people under it could see that and could see the light in the center and the three on the end. That is uh, man made. That is an anti grav uh, object. And we have many people who are, have been in the aerospace classified projects who have describe these and how they operate. And so we have massive files on these sort of different kinds of triangles. Now, just to make things more complex, because the world is complex, there are, are extraterrestrial vehicles that are triangular and that are saucer shaped and that are other weird shapes. So to make things complicated here, you, how are you gonna know? Well, you got to be close enough to it to see. And if you can't see the, the, the superstructure detail, you're not going to know whether it's extraterrestrial or not. But I'll, I'll give you a, these few hints. The ET ones are not manufactured by digging stuff up and soldering things together and or what have you. That's not how they manufacture. They are doing it through a frequency sonic resonance manufacturing that pulls from a template, an object in its entirety as a piece from the elementals, let's call it, of space time, the foundation of energy of space time. And it comes into 3D, like 3D printing, but 
for a whole spacecraft, but not putting plastic molding injectors in, but it being brought from the finest foundation of energy, not only the zero point, but beyond that even trans-dimensionally. So this is trans-dimensional manufacturing. We don't have time to go into this. We'll go into it more this week for, for, for everyone. And then this one, again, this is a very interesting one. This is the very famous uh, Phoenix Lights one. Who was here for that? Anybody? I was. So there are a couple of events that happened then. And I, we, we have had both ET vehicles then piggybacked on man-made events. And this is really confusing because once there's something that really happens demonstrably, that is a sighting or an event, they will then put in up objects and, and have things occur that are the man-made ones to confuse people. And they'll even do other decoils, so drop flares, all kinds of things. So when I was here in March of 1997, I flew in on an airline and as I was doing final approach into the Sky Harbor Airport, I did the CE5 protocols and asked the ETs to do something that would be very definitive that night or while I was there because we were at a digital lab that was run by an intelligence group and we were getting the best photos and videos that we could for the whole planet for the congressional briefings in April of 1997. That's why I was here. And then a few hours later, this whole event happened, Phoenix Lights, and there were a lot of things that were coming out of the South Mountains. Last November, when we were here for the Close Encounters of the Fifth Time premiere, we did a hike up there and came down at sunset, and an object dropped, materialized right over, so went who saw it. a couple of people who are my uh, friends here were there with me and saw it. So you have both phenomena happening, and this is the problem. We're, people are going to say, it's all man-made, it's all extraterrestrial. No, I mean, we need to get another layer of understanding here. And particularly any important thing that happens by definition is going to be inundated with a cover story and where they're going to deceive people from the real over to the staged, the DDT, let's call it. So these, these are more of the triangular. And this is a great one. This is 1989 in Belgium that you can see all the tubes and structures underneath so the Belgian cases. So this, what, this particular one was uh, very much a man-made one. So again, this is global. Don't think, you have to think, it's a transnational group that runs these unacknowledged special access projects, clandestine organization, is global. They don't think of international, they're transnational and have been at least since the 60s. And so here's another one, very interesting. Um, again, this is from Missouri. A little different from the, uh, the, the ones that you can see the, the girders and the welds on the side. I hope you can see that as the camera and the people on the webinar. And, and these, these are also well-known platforms. You can basically, once you get your lifter system in place that causes mass cancellation, you can create any kind of air structure around it. And it doesn't matter if it's aerodynamic or not, because the way it moves, it moves, let's say, the molecules of air around it. So it's basically moving an electromagnetic field effect. So there's no resistance and there is no sonic boom. That's man-made. We've had it for decades. <laughs> is this too much? I'm just trying to run through these. This is to give you just a sense of all the different types and structures that we know have been man-made objects, various different, some of them are kind of hybrids. They'll have some conventional propulsion as well as electrogravitic, um, different shapes. And they all have structural superstructure components that are clearly a man-made machine, not an interstellar vehicle. And this is one of my favorite, <laughs> I love this one because this one is, um, this is from Southern Illinois in 2000, not that long ago. Um, and it's, it's just uh, like a ranch house with the pen, but, but it's like, uh, how Midwestern. Um, and it's, it's this object, we're totally non-aerodynamic, silent, floating, some 
you'll hear a transformer buzzing sound often from these. And a similar rectangular ones were some years ago uh, in, I think it was in the 1990s, or were in uh, the Amazon. It was near where there was a uh, e-systems facility. And these were put up and engaged in, um, they, they went from animal mutilations being staged by clandestine human organizations to these were doing human vivisections and killing humans. But of course they wanted everyone to believe the aliens were doing vivisections on people. No, it wasn't. It was our sociopaths in this organization. So, and here's another, this is a great one. Uh, this is uh, from 1983, Hudson Valley, very famous cases many, many witnesses to these uh, transformer sounding objects and underneath when they were closed, you can see superstructure and tubes and other things. That is not extraterrestrial. Now, have there been extraterrestrial vehicles of boomerang and other shapes? Yes. But where do you think they get the idea? And also, how else do you create a false flag? You have to create structures that would be believably not aerodynamic. So, and this is another one. This is another boomerang shape of, from the Hudson Valley. Uh, this is a many, several years of these occurring. You've all heard these cases. And you see underneath the, the superstructure and the, and the aspects of it. And, you know, these are, 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 it looks a little bit like the B2 stealth, but this is different. Again, they were silent, unless you were close enough, you could hear this sort of electronic transformer sort of sound. And another one. So I just wanted to run through these. They're all fun. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, the people who have worked hard to, to create these from the reports and the photographs that exist. This one, actually, you could see up in it, the people looked in and they could see other structures and platforms inside under the center of this particular, not an equilateral triangle, but isosceles, is that correct? Yep. So, those are, are the reason I wanted to show you that is sort of to give you a sense of the variety, the type of craft. Um, I don't know if we had any other pictures. I think maybe some of them got dropped, but uh, but it's enough to give you a sense of, of what we have. Uh, now the archive on this is very large, and I want to pay homage to Mark McCandlish who did the drawings. If we want to bring up uh, Mark McCandlish's. Um, uh, work and the schematics. Now, this is based on uh, a very interesting event that happened at the Norton Air Force Base, which has now been decommissioned in Southern California. And there are a number of people, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, you know, uh, Brad Sorensen and some other people are there. There's a man on my team who was is, is very close friends with Frank Carlucci, Secretary of Defense at the time. Um, he calls him Uncle Frank who was there, uh, Senator Cranston was there because they were read into these unacknowledged projects. And this was a, a kind of like an air show and it was sort of a sales pitch going on. And you see these three objects. Uh, there was the smaller one, a medium one and a big one, you know, baby bear, mama bear and papa bear is, is one guy who was there called it. And these were from uh, around the components in them were for, uh, apparently from the, between 1950, late 50s, early 60s. But these particular models had obviously been used quite a bit and had gone in the solar system, various places in our solar system, not the whole universe, but our solar system back then, I mean, long before we landed on the moon. Now, what's interesting is that uh, one of the people who was there did an interview and, and shared some of the information and I'm loath to read to people, but this is just so compelling. I, I just want to share this. I'm not going to say who this was or how I got this recording transcript, but it's very interesting. And he says the small one was 20 feet. The next was 60 in diameter. And the next one, maybe 120 feet. Uh, it looked like it was a, the, the small one looked like personal light speed vehicle. It just boggles my mind to think about it. And he said that, uh, this one, these objects, didn't require its own fuel source. And they had found a new fuel source that was 
everywhere in the universe. It was a wavelength frequency that was on the order of 500 times the speed of light. Very important. It's invisible. We can't feel it. They said that everything in the universe is a vibration. Light is just a resisted vibration of this other force. It is, it is really fast vibrations or frequency. If you start with this force that's 500 times the speed of light and you resist it down, you get gravity. Resist down more and you get magnetism. Then resist it down more and you get light. Resist down and you get sound, heat, etc. And down to things we really recognize. Einstein and others could only sense light, so thought that's the fastest thing in the universe. That's all we can clock, and they were dead wrong that light is the fastest thing in the universe. If you wanted to go to the moon, say, you'd point the upper video camera that was on these objects and point it to wherever you wanted to go, and then you'd point, put the crosshairs on it, then you'd move the rheostat, a lever on the inside of the seat, to add power or and allow that power to be available and it would go and it goes on and on now why is this important because this was at an air show in 1988 and there's more than one witness to this by the way and we can put up mark mccandlish's schematic of the interior that was based on the description and uh, i want to honor mark mccandlish he just recently the last couple of weeks passed away but he was at the original National Press Club event, and he was just a really smart, courageous, talented aerospace illustrator who learned of this. Uh, and you can see some of the detail and where the compartment would be for the people. Um, according to some people who were there, some of this isn't exactly accurate, but it's a pretty close rendition. And it's a very important uh, piece of history because that was the transition between a Reagan administration and George H.W. Bush, Papa Bush. And it was in November of 1988. And they were trying to get more funding for Star Wars, SDI, what's now called Space Force, and classified aerospace contracting for these unacknowledged special access project systems. The reason this is all critically important for you to understand is that the people who are running these projects want you to think, as I said earlier, that nobody in the United States has any knowledge of these objects that they are now euphemistically calling UAPs, which is ludicrous, the term, on the face of it. I don't use it except in a ridiculing way because it's just absolutely not that. But ultimately, if you don't take my word for this and all the data and all the witnesses, why don't we listen to a guy named Ben Rich, head of the Lockheed Skunk Works. And Ben Rich had a, a friend that wrote to him, John Andrews, and he said, uh, the topic is UFOs. I believe there are lots of UFOs. And I'm also keen to believe that there are two categories, man-made UFOs and extraterrestrial UFOs. And Ben Rich says, yes. I'm a believer in both categories, and I feel everything is possible. Many of our man-made UFOs are unfunded opportunities, because there's funny underlining unfunded opportunities. There are opportunities that could, could have been used for a lot of great purposes. So this is dated 1986. And you know, Ben Rich was the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, was a very renowned aerospace figure. And you think, well, People who want, I think, first of all, this is this is a document, and all this is stuff going to need to go right to the Senate Intelligence Committee. We're, we're planning to do a closed briefing for them ahead of the Director of National Intelligence. So if the Director of National Intelligence dumps a bunch of falsehoods onto the Senate Intelligence Committee, they're going to have received all of this and more that you're seeing. We don't have time to go through all of it prior to. This is why this is very important. But I'd like to invite a wonderful gentleman up. Mr. Goodall. He's a renowned aerospace illustrator and researcher. And if you would come up, he has a couple just little, he's a sort of surprise guest here today. And I would welcome you to share your story, that last conversation that probably anyone had with Ben Rich, uh, and also your little uh, quick story you had with the lady who had worked for the National Security Agency. Sure. 
I was, I'm, I've been an aviation writer and uh, aerospace historian hey, most of my adult life. I'm 76, so it goes for a long time. But I had uh, somewhere along the line, and it was probably through John Andrews from Testers, that I became uh, a, a pen pal, if you want to call it that, with Ben Rich. He was Kelly Johnson's right-hand man, and when uh, Kelly Johnson retired, the only person that could really fill his shoes was Ben. And for 25 years, Ben and I spoke. He either called me or I called him once a quarter for 25 years. I could call him at Skunk Works. June, his secretary, would say, just a second, I'll, con I'll put you into Mr. Rich. He'd be in a conference with a room full of engineers. He put me on speakerphone, and we talked for 40 minutes, 45 minutes. But uh, he was dying of esophageal cancer. This is the, the mid-90s. He'd already retired from Lockheed. And I tracked him down. He was at USC Medical Center uh, near, near the end of his, his life. And we were talking about John Andrews and some other stuff, and we started talking about UFOs. And he said, Jim, we have things out in the desert, and he wasn't referring to Area 51, but said, we have things out in the desert that's 50 years be beyond what you, and he was you know, talking directly to me, beyond what you can imagine. And he said, if you've, and if you've seen movies like Star Trek or Star Wars, we've been there, done that, or decided it wasn't worth the effort. I said, Ben, you want to expand upon that? And typical Ben response was no, and he had the nerve to die on me about 10 days later. Uh, the other thing, uh, late last year, I think 2019, maybe it was 2020, and this, the last two years have been sort of a blur. Uh, on CN, I'm not sure if it was CNN, but uh, Tucker Carlson on Fox announced that the federal government had made, made a statement that we have uh, equipment that is uh, not of this earth. And it was also a government employee that said the same thing. So I have a friend of mine who works for the National Security Agency. I uh, knew her from Hawaii, and she was in Pine Gap, which is Alice Springs, which is the middle of nowhere, if you've ever been to Australia. And I, I sent her an email. I said, do you believe in UFOs? And I mean, instantly I got a response back. I said, no, why did you see one? And I said, no. And then she came back. I said, well, I can't I can't go over it on, you know, through electronic means. Maybe one of these days we can sit down face to face. He said, but they're here. And that was your comment. Now she was, she went from uh, Pine Gap to Guantanamo Bay, and now she's back in Hawaii. And I hope to get to Hawaii sometime this year and sit down with her face to face. That's my piece. Thank you very Jim, much. My pleasure. Very important little pieces of, of history. Um, now, the, the, the next thing I want to share, because I know, I mean, we have so much today, um, is something that uh, I want to set the stage before we put it up on screen. A few months ago, a woman who is the granddaughter um, uh, of a, a seamstress who was at the atomic bomb site, who actually uh, was the seamstress that made the cover for the first atomic bomb. So it could be moved out and put on the aircraft and then dropped on Nagasaki and then Hiroshima. And this particular uh, woman said, look, my grandmother lived to be 90 some. She had been at the atomic bomb site and then was moved to Roswell and she was there when the, Ros the crash happened in Ro near Roswell in 1947. And all she would ever say is that she absolutely knows that the ETs are real. That's all she would say. So, you know, the family never knew anything else. Uh, she, her, this woman's grandmother passed away. And a few years later, they were going through the attic and picked up a book and out falls a five by 10 uh, photograph. And it's a photograph of some kind of humanoid being that we do not know from whence it came. And she was convinced it had to be one of the bodies from the Roswell event. And we started looking at it. And, and of course, 
being a doctor, I was looking at, I, I wasn't a doctor in 1947, but it didn't look quite right. I thought it looked more European. Um, and then I enlisted the help of a number of people to research this. And uh, Pat Pearsall here uh, helped find uh, a, a Dr. Burns, uh, who is the most renowned medical archivist in the world um, in New York. And he looked at it and he says, no, the medical garb, the setup, all of it is in an autopsy. It's, he wanted to be very scientific. It's a dissection of something from the 1920s, between 1922, 1929. Then we had a member of our team who had very good connections with the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they have a whole division on clothing and eras and all that. They looked at, they said, absolutely, this is mid 1920s. So we're talking 20 to 25 years before Roswell. And what are we looking at here? It, unfortunately, I'm not wired. I thought I would be, but I can't walk over to it. But you have, if you want to zoom in on the, on the head and the body, uh, oh dear. Oh boy. This is why I never touch a computer. Um, oh, it left. Well, he'll come back. See, I don't understand all this. Give me a big thing like this. But while he's bringing it back up, I will speak from this one. So you have what look like, you know, military or intelligence civilians here, here, and here. You have medical personnel. This is the main uh, doctor doing the, the dissection. This blob here is just damage on the emulsion. We had the paper tested, the original paper, because we, we had access to it. And the original paper is from pre early 50s, we know that. We also know that it's a photo of a photo, okay? And, and I, I'm just telling you what we know. I'm giving you the facts first and I'm gonna give you an educated assessment after. And it's a very unusual head and eyes. You can't see great detail, but you can see some. It's got a, a towel over it. Obviously you had probably a lot of facial and neurotrauma. Um, you can see uh, the body cavity and the ribs, very unusual in, in how it's structured, almost like an external, these bumps on the outside, certainly not a, a, a normal human. And uh, the hands and the feet and the legs. So we're dealing with something, you know, that isn't a, a homo sapien, a human. But we don't know what it is. I'm not calling it an extraterrestrial at this point because we need more in information which is why I was given permission to disclose it to you today. And if it is what we think it is, it is in point of fact, one of the most important things ever to surface because it predates Roswell by two decades or more. And it is also clearly some kind of formal operation uh, going on dissecting this. And now I have been told by a number of my contacts in the intelligence community who have been in the vault, as they call it, that there are files classified still top secret on this issue from the late 1800s and early 1900s. They never went through them, but they know that they were related to extraterrestrial intelligence and UFOs going that far back. This is now 100 years ago. So I will pass this around. You're free to look at it. Um, the, those of you at home, you can you know, zoom in and out as I, I, I now talk about my assessment. So I believe what happened, because I've been involved in a number of cases as a medical doctor and emergency doctor and forensic cases, that when the Roswell event happened and this woman, Ms. Heaven was her name, was there at Roswell and been at the atomic bomb project, she was cleared to a very high level of secrecy, even though she was doing a rather ordinary task as a seamstress. But when Roswell happened, if there was actionable intelligence and files in an archive on prior re retrievals or events, those would have been curated in so that they would have had a comparative anatomy and a comparative uh, point of reference in studying the retrieval of the objects from the Roswell crash. What I think happened, now this we don't know, we're asking for the public to help, is that they needed these older files 
and someone she knew who was probably in the photo lab at the Walker Field said, wow, look at this. And he took a picture of the picture and gave it to her, but she secreted it away until she died and it fell out of a book. Now that, those are the facts that are known facts. It came from someone at Roswell, but it's not Roswell. It came from someone clear to the level of the atomic bomb project, the Manhattan project, and to be at Roswell, which at the time, the 509th bomber squadron was the only place in the world that had atomic bombs in 1947. And, and yet it isn't that era, but that's even more explosive. It means these covert programs that have studied this issue go back much further. Now, what we're asking for specifically for the public, look at these men. You, people out there may have family pictures who will know who one of these people are. If we can identify one of them, then we can connect it further and begin to go deeper into what this really means. Or if you're in a classified project and have access to the vault and you know who you are, contact me if you have any detailed information on this. I am telling you everything we know. Most of what we should know about this case, we have no idea. This was a serendipitous, strange thing that happened where these people who we know the provenance of the photograph, we've tested it, we know it's from the 20s. We know that the, the woman uh, in whose belongings it was found, who had deceased, was in fact at Roswell. We can prove it and that she had been on the atomic bomb project. More than that, we don't know. I'm giving you an informed assessment of probably what this is. But we need the public. This is why we can crowdsource digging into this. And maybe someone has an answer that's very ordinary. I doubt it. Not that particular being. Um, so anyway, that is something that I, I think is a really important case. It's in development. Um, we've hit a wall. The family and my team, we can't go any further without someone being able to tell us who any one of those people might be. And you may have a family album from your great, great grandfather, whoever from the twenties, who would have been an adult then, because all those men are dead by now, obviously, um, who might know who they are. And from there, we might be able to connect them to an operation, an agency, a military branch, what have you. So that's what we're asking you guys to help us with. So what I want to do next is to show a number of clips of some interesting interviews that are really astonishing. The next, the first one is astonishing in the sense that we got it on record. So about two weeks ago, um, I, I interviewed at the Watergate in Washington, the son of a member of the committee that had been dealing with UFOs and ET issues for, for a number of years, and that's Senator John Warner. His son is, is John Warner IV. And John Warner IV um, is also the grandson of Paul Mellon, and the Paul Mellon, one of the few billionaires at the end of World War II. And he told me the very first time I met him five or six years ago, uh, John Warner IV said, look, my entire family are fascists. And he didn't mean it in the way that it's bandied around now. Of course, you know, now anyone you disagree with, you call a fascist, it's terrible. But I, I mean, in the true sense that they were ardent supporters of fascism, supporters of Adolf Hitler until we declared war. And this includes Prescott Bush, George H.W. Bush's father, Henry Ford, uh, Watson of IBM, and Paul Mellon. And he informed me that at the end of World War II, his father actually went over with General Patton and with Alan Dulles. Now, this is a founding family we're talking about here, Paul Mellon, and his grandson is telling the story of the CIA and this whole covert program. So let's listen to these. Now, this is a three-hour interview. <laughs> So we have just a few clips here, but I, I want to share them with you because they're very important. Project Paperclip, most likely we got 5,000 or more scientists. Uh, we got, I heard we got trainloads of paperwork, mature nonlinear physics experiments, Walter Gerlach's uh, research, the death camp research, 
we got all that, as well as you know the the uh, the Bell project, the plasma accelerator, you know all that kind of stuff in that deal. My granddad and I, when we were talking, I'll never forget it. And he said he was talking about Patton, and of course he said I was in Czechoslovakia with Patton in April of '45, and I thought, oh, that was neat. You know, what did you do? And then he's like, well, you know, they Patton had to secure a lot of the stuff that the SS had, and I said, oh, that's interesting, and you know, and. Today we know it as the SSE4 division under Hans Kammler, General Hans Kammler, and of course uh, Gestapo Müller also had a security, three levels of security around that town, um, which was pretty dense. And of course the SS we know today had their own funding streams. They were totally independent of the Reichstag, and you know a lot of that treasure in Switzerland they had access to unlimited funds, right. uh, which sounds a lot like the deep state today. And so. I said, what were you doing with Patton? He said, oh, it was interesting. Memory serves that granddad told me they were with General Marshall, but I could be wrong on that. But I remember that he said he's, he was with Patton, probably maybe Marshall, maybe some other generals. And they said, well, we went into this warehouse and there were all these exotic, you know, jet aircraft, rocket engines, parts of the V2 and maybe a V3, I don't know. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And he says, I saw a disc shaped aircraft. And I said, I'd, known, I'd done some history work by that time. I said, oh, is that the one they built? I can't remember who built it, Arado or maybe someone else, that had the BMW jet engines and the Arado ones in a circle, and it didn't really work and everything like that. And he said, no. And that was it. It was time for lunch. The guests had arrived. The wine flowed, blah, 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 blah. And I went away as a college student. I was like, well, that's interesting. And it didn't hit me until I read Nick Cook's book, mm -hmm. I think in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, this is getting really weird because you know, in 1993, when I was 31, I showed the, the Majestic 12 documents to my dad and we went back and forth on that. And I said, you know, I've heard of you know, Roswell and Pelona Peak and Corona. I've heard of some of these UFO crashes, but are, are these real? And he said, oh no, you know, that, you know, I checked with the Pentagon, the FBI, it's all hoax. And we went back and forth for months on this. And he finally said, look, just don't go down that road. You know, he says, live your life, enjoy yourself, but don't, you know, they, they, they have it all in, under control. They know what they're doing. And I said, dad, how the hell can I live my life if this is the truth of our world? Mm -hmm. so, so this disc in the warehouse, uh, obviously we got it, and it ended up somewhere in the United States. Uh, Probably Wright-Patterson, Wright Field as they called it back, back then. then. Mm -hmm. I am not a documents expert, but mm -hmm. I know 60s mimeograph sheets like you and I had in school. I mean, right. they smell funny. Yes. He's a guy in my car club, and he was you know, in the Air Force. His father was a three-star general in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say his name. I, I promise I never would. Yes, I understand that. I mean, you know, it's just my story. You know. But um, he and I started talking about this, and he says, you know, my wife and I have seen all kinds of strange phenomena. We've had you know, glowing Foo Fighters come into our home and you know, all this stuff. And he says, I want to show you something. And so his father left him a, a large safe. Then he said, well, I had to get my Navy SEAL buddy over here with some C4, and they blew the hinges off. And you can see where <laughs> they blew the damn hinges off. And I said, holy shit. And inside were Air Force documents with, you know, disc craft and, and a lot of technical terms in German, which I thought was interesting. And he said, these were from 58 to 63, I think. And the dates were on them. And I recognized the terms, you know, vortex compression, you know, plasma accelerator, you know, uh, zero, you know, zero point uh, gravitational field, you know, all this stuff. And the schematic had an Air Force serial number. And <laughs> we were just flipping through them, hundreds of them. Now, these looked a lot like the German Hanabu ones, the Vril saucers, you know, three maneuvering nodes underneath, you know, powdered quartz with monatomic gold and insulators, you know torsion field uh, maneuvering nodes that we know now. I figured that out. I, I actually sketched that out, a TR3B black triangle, how it worked with the plasma ring and the three nodes with monatomic gold and, and powdered quartz to Chris Mellon. You know, he's like, oh, wow, you and Tom DeLonge were into the wild stuff. I just shook my head and I was like, okay, whatever. But atomic weapons, and I'm sure you know this, 
Oppenheimer was famous for saying, I have become death, the, the destroyer of worlds. Correct. Well, that's from the Vedic texts. Yep. And what he found out from the Vedic texts that the Ananerme SS and all those Tula Society and everyone else and all the societies knew, and Rudolf Steiner and Gurdjieff probably knew, the theosophists, was that when you light off a nuclear weapon of a certain yield, it not only affects the local battlefield at hand, but it rips through several dimensions of the universe, the local universe, and you get additional casualties. And that's why when we started, you know, the, I think the Germans tested one in the Baltic in, in October of 44, I think that was true, the Navy did the Zinsser report on it. We go through these Yuga cycles, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's like Atlantis again, we're, we're starting to do, uh, you know, uh, material science, you know, uh, regressive, you know, actions, you know, chimera construction with DNA, atomic weapons again, and scalar and, and, and you know, free energy weapons, which can crack the earth in half. Correct. Dangerous stuff. Dangerous stuff. You know, yeah. As yeah. you said, firecrackers, but it's more than firecrackers. These kids are playing with C4 and they're three years old. Yeah, yeah, they're three-year-olds playing with C4. Chunks of it as big as this table, you know, enough to blow up you know, an entire right. house. You know, it's, it's incredibly dangerous. And so Oppenheimer knew that. And the other person that worked with Oppenheimer at the Rad Lab at MIT, not only was Vannevar Bush, he was big time UFO file, was John G. Trump, the president's uncle. Correct. So that's how President Trump knew a lot about all this that we're talking about, because his uncle mm -hmm. and he were close. And his uncle was read in along with Vannevar Bush and Oppenheimer and everybody on the Foo Fighter file, as it was known back then and the German atomic program, our atomic program, the Klystron II scalar weaponry, radar research, you know, and all that stuff at the Rad Lab. That was the Area 51, you know, if you, at MIT where the eggheads were, but Wright Field in Ohio was the place in those days. But that's something every American should understand is John G. Trump, because a lot of his physics work is still classified. Yes. And why? I'm of the opinion they're given a very thin file to work from. And, you know, Chris and I have met, we've talked about all this stuff. Um, I think the TTSA program was a little goofy with Tom DeLong. I don't know what, you know, Hal Putoff was wanting, you know, soliciting me for funds for his quantum communication thing, which I think the Navy has had for 30 years. Um, so there's a lot of disconnects going on. And of course, they've left that TTSA program, and I don't blame them. Uh, I think it was a shit show and uh, some type of CIA, you know, quasi psyop something. And I don't think anybody was really excited about it. Uh, I was a little hard on him and I, I will because I was expecting much more disclosure after four years of this. And when they say this is a mystery we need to solve, that is not true. As you and I know, the U.S. military, especially the Navy, has reams of information on every shape of craft, where it's from, who's driving it, what they're up to, you know, forget it. It's just been going on for 70 years. Uh, the military industrial complex is not stupid. Uh, neither is all the branches of the military. They know exactly what's going on. And this Tic Tac, the word is, it's Lockheed Martin. It's the successor to the TR-3G Black Triangle model. You know? And of course, there are stories by Charles Hall that the uh, tall white ETs out at the Indian Springs, at the S4 and the Nellis Range, uh, had these, lo and behold, these white Tic Tac looking things that they used as buses. And so I'm thinking, aha, maybe there's a connection there. And maybe that validates some of his story. And so when you start piecing all this together, you know, you know I'm glad that they're doing something. But it's, you know, Elizondo just will talk the bark off a tree. He goes in circles. He's a great counterintelligence guy. Uh, I'd love to get into a debate with him, but of course that's never going to happen. Um, you know, it's, I think Chris it, it means well. I, I really do. I don't think he's one of these guys, you know, that's going around here. I'm going to fool the public and get paid for it. He doesn't need the money. I don't need money. We don't need fame or money. That's the last thing a melon wants. I'm telling you. Uh, we're very private as a family. I, I can pretty much guarantee you that. His brother was in the press a little bit, but you know, 
I think he, he sees this as a patriotic job. I think he believes that that report is genuine and there's maybe not much more and that, that he's okay with this is what I'm allowed to talk about and the rest of it is national security and that cannot be talked about. They've lied by omission and when they say it's a mystery, that's, that's a lie. Okay, sorry, but that, you know, I'm not on board with that and that, you know. But, but they have to know that's a lie. Right. So they, they do, and I, I think you know, it's obvious. So you know, that's why I'm giving this interview with you today. I mean, I've had enough uh, of that. I had enough with my dad. You know, was he a liaison to Majestic 12 as a magic member? Probably. He, was. You know, he probably had two pages of the UFO file. You know, mm -hmm. Don't worry about the rest of it. Just the two pages are all you need. Okay, yes, sir. You know, and Chris is going, yes, sir, too. Whatever factions in the Pentagon, as you know, everything is factions. Whatever factions they represent, it's like, well, we want to have disclosure, but not, not really real disclosure. And so they're, they're slowing everything down. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why Chris is involved either, except in my opinion, this is just me, I think there's a reason they picked a Mellon. Because we've had other families, this is a tradition in our family. You know, as you said, the Mellons were the first family of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. From my, you know, the people that I've talked to, uh, that will go along with, you know, we need to do this for the good of the country. You know, yes, you got to lie and do whatever you have to do, but you know, this is what we need to do, and they'll just do it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I'm, I'm a private citizen. I've never worked for the government or the military, mm -hmm. I, but I, you know, I'm not going to get up there. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, stay silent when pe members of my family lie to the American people. I won't do that. It's one thing for my dad, you know, in the old days, mm -hmm. to get up there and do some mild fibs about, you know, mm -hmm. highways. This is not. You're, you're messing around with the survival capability of the human race. Correct. I mean, I'm not, that's not an overstatement. Right. This is deadly serious. It's not funny. Right. You're sort of half joking, but I thought you were somewhat serious that you said, you know, a lot of my family are fascists or were fascists, or fascist sympathizers. And you talk about that a little bit, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. Oh, that. there's no doubt. I mean, Andrew Mellon was up front about it. <laughs> you know, he was uh, uh, Secretary of the Treasury uh, under Harding and Hoover. Uh, he was ambassador to the Court of St. James in 1931, a good friend of the royal family. That's where this Mellon royal family thing uh, connection comes in. Uh, his outdated policies with Rockefeller, Morgan, Carnegie, DuPonts, you know, that made the Great Depression much worse, mm -hmm. I believe. I've also heard that, you know, he was uh, uh, heavily invested in DuPonts nylon, which came around in the late 30s for naval rope. And of course, hemp and marijuana were made strategic materials and therefore illegal. Of course, it was a war on consciousness, too. Oh, we don't want people smoking those jazz cigarettes. You know, that would be bad, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Andrew, and of course, their dealings with Sullivan and Cromwell on Wall Street, the Dulles brothers, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles. Oh, invest in Nazi Germany. You know, Hitler's a great guy. He's a Republican. Don't worry about it. You'll make lots of money. And then Standard Oil, you know, through straw man in Portugal all during the war. I mean, business thrives during war. You know that. It's a racket. And so, you know, my grandfather wasn't the industrialist kind of war profiteer that Andrew was. But he was more into the mystic intelligence side, for sure. And if your bottom line, brass tacks, if you're on the CFR with Alan Dulles, you're in the Trilateral Commission, you're on the Jason Society, you're Scroll and Key at Yale, which Scroll and Key and the, the Skull and Bones are directly connected to the Tula Society of Germany and the Vril Society, um, and you're a Knight of the or Order of Orange Nassau, you've got a KBE from the Queen, my dad does too, um, you're not a friend of the common American. Uh, you're just not. You're a very, you know, neocon, ultra conservative. You know, I don't buy this whole, yes, he was a gentleman horse racer. You know, he had a racing team of stables. He, he was, you know, donated the National Gallery, the East Wing. His father donated the other National Gallery. You know, these are things they did, in my opinion so that the American people would put a gold wreath on their heads and go, what great oligarchs these guys are, billionaires, oligarchs. 
see what great things they do. Now that's a great thing to do to donate an art museum, but it's a great cover story. I mean, Andrew Mellon had intimate dealings with Halmar Schacht, who was Hitler's private banker. And so did Sullivan and Cromwell. I mean, this is, this is dirty, nasty history. And uh, it doesn't make, I don't, I mean, it took me years really to gather all the intelligence bits and to come up, you know, a lot of it I'm con connecting dots on my own, but they make sense to me given my German history and the history of the military industrial complex and everything and why the Mellons are so active still. And, you know, secrecy and big money and these big American families, some call them the Committee of 300. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably a loose term, but, you know, I've never heard it, but, it, you know, it makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah um, I've had that confirmed that it's, it is yeah. a committee around 300 that are involved in, in these operations. And it's not just extraterrestrial UFO, it's a whole lot of aspects of technology, finance, global, uh, geopolitical. My friend who was an ONI Navy captain, he, we had a dinner one night and he said, you know, I said, what can you tell me? And he spent 30 years in the ONI and he said, well, you know, we're pretty proud of our satellites. You know, we're competing with the Air Force and they're two-man satellites. And we've got our own two-man satellites. I thought, oh, that's interesting. And they, you know, they have scalar weaponry and he was like, well, I can't comment to that. You know, more wine, more wine. And he said, uh, I said, tell me about the, your tracking systems. And he says, oh, you know, that's, that's, I love that. And he's like, we can track those bastards, UAP, UFOs, punching in and out, superluminal, and we can track them 25 miles under the earth. Mm -hmm. Under the earth. Or the ocean. Yes. And tell me a little bit about Mount Weather. I mean, you use that, I think a lot of people don't know why that was important at that time. The official narrative is that Mount Weather was built in the Blue Ridge uh, during the Kennedy administration as a continuance of government, COG. Mm -hmm. And I think it still is. Um, my dad's been down under there. Um, my dad also tells me about the high-speed train they have because during 9-11, he told me that, I said, because I was out of touch with him for five days, he said, well, they had us out D.C. to an undisclosed location. It wasn't Mount Weather, it was in West Virginia, in seven minutes. And I said... Oh, is that the maglev train that goes Mach 2 in, in a vacuum tube? And, oh, well, how did you know that? And I mean, my dad always wonders how I know this stuff. But Mount Weather, um, the rumors are that it goes down, you know, probably a mile or two down to the sub shuttle system and, and connects to other deep underground military bases. Um, why else it's in the Blue Ridge in that lo specific location, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, it's a top secret facility. It's still at very active and expanding. And if they're expanding on the surface, as you know, they're probably expanding tenfold beneath the surface. Right, correct. Yeah. Had your grandfather, Paul Mellon, been in Mount Weather? Oh, I'm sure. But I, he never told me that. Uh -huh. right. um, I don't remember that as part of our conversation. But certainly that's all connected with his jet strips and his meetings and, mm -hmm. and Mount Weather. You know, these are all connected things. You know, for all I know, there's a tunnel from his farm to Mount Weather. I mean, I have no idea, but mm -hmm. it wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me if that were true. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't take pleasure in any of this. This, this family history is very disturbing and, and actually disheartening for me. Mm -hmm. From a three-hour interview with uh, John Warner IV, grandson of Paul Mellon and son of a member of the committee, the Majority Intelligence Committee, um, who's still alive and is about 94, um, and, and there's a, a great deal more information, obviously, in the interest of time. You know, we can't go through all of it. We wanted to pick a few highlights to give you an idea of the depth of the archive we have. We're trying to put together a multi-year, you know, 10, 20 episodes per year disclosure file series for a major streaming group because we have about 200 hours of riveting content that we have in our archives and, and the world needs to see it and I'd like to get it out before I uh, meet my maker. So that's that's what we're, we're working on. Now there's another very important uh, video I'd like to, to show and uh, it's one that relates to the case we had earlier, the Cash Landrum case. So we can show that from Air Force Office of Special Investigations, uh, Richard Doty. 
Were there human pilots on board? Or really? I never saw it land, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't Did know you ever meet an Air Force pilot who piloted them? Only the, one, only the cash lander. Mm -hmm. I actually interviewed him. Oh, you or, did? There were four of them. I mean, there was two, there was two, the two pilots. There was a, um, uh, a systems officer that was handling the, the equipment, and then there was a, uh, I can't remember what the fourth person did. He was a navigator or what he was. And um, I, I, I interviewed them. And, and everything that could have gone wrong, it took off fine from Nevada and flew perfectly. But Where when they, it was, it was going to um, an air base. I can't remember which air base it was. Some, some air base in Texas. I think it was Webb Air Force Base in Big Springs, I think it was. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Webb. And when they tried to slow it down, that's when the problem set. And then they cut power and so many things went wrong that uh, they almost crashed. They called for rescue helicopters because they thought they thought it were gonna crash. So these helicopters came out, but they finally got it going again and they landed at some place. Apparently it was just past where they spurred all this radiation on those two poor people or three people or however many it were. And then they, then they flew it back to uh, Nevada. It was pretty huge. It was a, uh, one of those big ones. It was, a, uh, it was uh, not uh, a saucer shape. It was more of a huge oval shape. Was it man-made? It was, it, was, it was reverse engineered. Reverse engineered, yeah. yes. They trained nine months before they ever flew it. And then they trained another, uh, I can't remember how long, four or five months flying it all around Nevada. And it worked fine. But the problem is it's a, it's a reverse engineered alien craft with a, one of our nuclear propulsion systems. Mm -hmm. That wasn't refined because they couldn't figure out how to reverse engineer the aliens. They, they got it to work at times but they couldn't manipulate it the way they, they needed to for a human pilot to fly it. So they had to put one of our uh, propulsion system in it and it, you know, it malfunctioned. And they, and they trained and there wasn't any, any, the pilot told me they were flying and everything seemed, they were flying at a high altitude, I can't remember what altitude it was, flying perfectly fine, no problems whatsoever until they slowed down. He said, and then all oh, hell broke loose. And then the system just malfunctioned, and they had this uh, some something that was supposed to throw thrust, but the the thruster was moving all around, and and they had a filter, some kind of filter that was filtering, supposed to filter that didn't work, that didn't come down, and it was just a mess. Do you know what kind of velocities this craft reached? Uh, it could go uh, Mach 1, okay. and I, 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 that's all I was told, I mean, maybe probably more than that, but uh, just what he told me, what the pilot told me when I interviewed him was he, he, he had it up to Mach 1. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a hybrid craft. It has some aspects of the ET craft and others yeah. of the conventional. Yeah, craft. the body and everything was ET. The only thing that was propulsion was our, it was us, it was American, and, and, and or, or, or conventional, or actually a nuclear, uh, and it just didn't work. And there were four humans. Yeah, four, four humans in it. And none of them suffered any radiation problems. It's just those poor people on the ground. A couple of nuclear weapons sent into space were destroyed by the extraterrestrials. In talking to various contacts throughout, they would allude to the fact that these did happen. There was, for example, the, the missile, Minuteman missile, which destroyed the launch from Vandenberg Air Force Base. That's now a public matter of record. The one incident, for example, was they, they actually photographed the uh, UFO following the missile as it climbed into space and shining a beam on it, which uh, neutralized the, ve uh, the missile. And that is their major concern, is to preserve the integrity of the Earth, because it affects their own system. Well, there was one incident when uh, we exploded the nuclear weapon uh, over the Pacific, and this was in about 61, I believe. 
and the consternation that it caused because it shut out communications entirely over the Pacific Basin for a number of hours in which no radio transmission was available at any time. And this was very significant and of course this was one of the things that the extraterrestrials later I learned were highly concerned about because it affected our ionosphere and in fact spacecraft were unable to operate because of the pollution in the magnetic field of which they depended upon. The very end of the 70s or the early 80s, we attempted to put a nuclear weapon on the moon and explode it for scientific measurements and other things, which was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials. And what happened? They destroyed the weapon before it got to the moon. With reference to the incident which our government sent a nuclear weapon for explosion on the moon's surface. It was tended to, as I understand it, to assess some scientific data and reaction and so forth. The idea of any explosion in space by any Earth government was not acceptable to the extraterrestrials, and that has been demonstrated over and over. And what's the consequence? How is that demonstrated? By the destruction of any nuclear weapons sent into space. Thank you, guys. And again, uh, thank you for all attending and everyone online. Thank you guys for your participation and your help and all of you helped make this uh, whole event possible. Uh, the next person who will be presenting is Paula Harris. And Paula and Harris and I have known each other for at least 22 years. And she has been so pivotal in assisting with the Disclosure Project. And when she lived in Rome, uh, was a teacher there. Uh, but also a journalist investigating this issue and hosted me uh, in Rome and introduced me to some amazing people, not only uh, at the Vatican, like Monsignor Balducci, but also uh, some scientists and military officials, uh, Vatican astronomers, et cetera. And, and she's just done an enormous body of work since the 70s on this subject, uh, including uh, really intimate relationships with Colonel Corso, getting to know him and his whole story very well. Uh, all the way back to people like Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was, of course, the, the head of the Project Blue Book back in, in the 60s. So we're really honored to, to welcome Paula Harris. Thank you. No, it's really me that's honored to be here. And this is a historical occasion. And when Stephen asked me to speak, I said, yes, this needs to get done. We're going to do it. This happens to be not entertainment for me. This happens to be part of my life uh, journey as a journalist. So my first slide was me speaking at the Washington Press Club uh, with the X Conference, representing journalists. I am not a ufologist. Although we have a field of ufology, unfortunately, that doesn't help the situation very much. So my job is to just get the testimony for you, to put it, I've written five books in three different languages so that you can make up your mind what's going on. And it shouldn't be told to you on YouTube. It should not be told to you by other people you're intelligent enough to know what's going on. And before uh, you know, I even begin, I have to acknowledge my colleagues and the brave heroes that walk their talk. And Stephen said, we've known each other for 22 years. And he was, I brought him to Europe to testify because this is not an American phenomena. This is an international phenomena and Stephen had an effect on people in Italy. And when he spoke in Barcelona, Spain, he is the only one, 1,400 people gave him a standing ovation. 1,400 people who were not into entertainment, who came to that conference, if you remember, were scientists, they were uh, 
people who were professional. There were no tinfoil hats. Nobody bought gadgets. And it was not a, a circus atmosphere. I had never spoken to 1,400 people anywhere except Barcelona, Spain. And I was shocked that it was not a circus atmosphere. And Stephen got a standing ovation. In fact, there's going to be a slide of him because he has an orb on one of his shoulders. <laughs> I don't know who that was. <laughs> He's very strange sometimes. And I want to acknowledge Danny Sheehan for his, his contribution. He was the not only the counsel for the disclosure project, he was at another disclosure event, which was the citizen hearing of 2013 that had 36 men and one woman. <laughs> if you remember the, the uh, citizen hearing in Washington, DC, where there were 36 different people from South American countries, from Europe, they're from England, uh, there was England, Italy, Uruguay, Paraguay. If you don't think disclosure has happened, I don't know, are you sleeping? What do you think disclosure is? The latest flavor of ice cream that comes out of the media? This is the problem with this whole thing is that people think they're misguided, they think that what comes out of the um, government is going to be disclosure. That's not where disclosure is. Disclosure is a serious study of this phenomenon. And unfortunately, people don't read anymore. Because if they go back to read the original source material, starting from Leonard Stringfield, Alan Hynek, and so forth, all the people that worked on this for years, and they would do it scholarly, they would get disclosure. The, the four diaries of Jacques Vallée have days, day by day entries of all of the process of what has been going on with all the groups that tried to get together to have some kind of disclosure. Unfortunately, this particular country is interested in one thing, the technology. And in the 1950s, if you bothered to look at the giant rock group, for you people that date back, the people that met the Van Tassels, the Mengers, the, um, the early contactees, and I had to go back there to study this because I was our field, and I, I'm the only one that's gonna mention this, is little gray aliens, abductions, and all kinds of mythologies that are unproven. And that when you go to a conference, that's what you're seeing. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, do they bother to go back and see in the 1950s? And the reason why I go back to the 1950s is because it goes back further than that. And that's the case I'm gonna talk about, 1945. What happened July 16th, 1945? We exploded the atomic bomb. So it's no coincidence that all that stuff happened in New Mexico, because that's the history that began this problem. And I've heard all kinds of testimony now because it, the explosion of an atomic bomb has repercussions in other dimensions. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. That somebody, we got somebody's attention. We got somebody's attention. I've heard this before, but you know, the kids have discovered the matches and you can't put the genie back in the bottle. So let's start this with the first slide. I, I spoke to the Washington Press Club because at that time, <clears throat> Stephen Bassett had asked me to speak to journalists. And of course, what I said is, look, you guys, just tell the story the way it is. Don't put a spin on it. And there was a series of international people there. So what did the Washington Post do? The red vote, the, uh, the blue vote, and the little green man vote. 
So they made fun of it. So the media is not on board here. So I, I asked them to do that. By the way, in Barcelona, I was the only woman with all men. At the, uh, here at the, at the National Press Club, I was the only woman. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen Vassar, for letting me speak. But more thank you, Stephen Gurr, for having two women. <laughs> because this is, the woman's perspective is a whole other perspective here. And this is a field of men. And so you heard Carol speak. Sometimes we get some things done. And sometimes we see the 360 picture. So I am very grateful to him for changing the paradigm. All right, so I tried Washington Press Club. Next. But you know, I didn't pick this. Um, in 1979, I watched Close Encounters of the Third Kind and got very emotional at the very end uh, when there was that contact. If you remember Francois Truffaut that met the beings at the very end. And I was a teacher, like Carol. I, I taught high school for 40 years and I have a master's in education. So I'm always gonna talk about reading and getting educated. So what happened is I was at a wedding in Evanston, Illinois. I walked into the Center for UFO Studies and uh, by coincidence, Alan Hynek was there. And I went up to him and I said, is this real? It, it, are you, is this, it, you know, what I saw in that movie, was that real? And he said, yes, he was working at Project Blue Book at the time. And he said, yes, he said, I heard you speak Italian. And I said, I do. And he said, would you help me? Would you help me uh, with the Italian sightings? I'm gonna send you some boxes full of letters I'm getting from all over the world. So I was lucky, whoever gave me this assignment gave me the best teacher. How can you have any better teacher than Alan Eidick, who's an astronomer and a scientist? So I'm dealing with real science and we're and working with Alan, that's a very young Paula Harris there, uh, taught me to listen. It taught me to listen, put together facts, do not make judgments and collect the material. Okay, next. And you can see at a sense of humor. And I think we need one. I'm so overloaded by what I've heard and what I've seen. <laughs> And Ellen said, laugh, laugh, study, study. Let's not forget our sense of humor here. <laughs> like, and I miss him so much because I worked with him for six years. And he taught me a lot. Um, go ahead. Okay, uh, what happened in 19, I think it was 1999 was that Stephen Greer came to Italy and he asked me to help them with the disclosure project, which meant we rented a room near the train station in Rome and we filed all these military people in and they gave testimony, we filmed it. And then he asked me to meet Monsignor Corrado Balducci of the Vatican, who made the statement, the next one, um, there's Monsignor Balducci with Stephen. He said, we don't, need, the devil doesn't need UFOs. And this is very important because one of the problems that I thought at that time that had to do with disclosure was that uh, it had to do with the downfall of religions or people panicking and so forth. And he said, no, he, uh, he actually said, I'm a demonologist. This has nothing to do with the devil. Believe it or not, in Roswell, once they put me on a panel to talk about the devil. And I said to these, and these were engineers. And I said, why are you doing that? And they said, wouldn't you rather believe in Jesus Christ than aliens? They said, are you out of your minds? This is not about religion. So get a clue. And if you attribute it to the box of religion, then we will never learn the truth. Wouldn't it be great if we could learn we had friends out there? If this planet was not the only one if there is a civilization that's more evolved. And that is what Balducci said. He told Stephen, he said, look, we're the bottom of the barrel. He said, in all these years, we have not evolved. He said, they're watching us and trying to get us to a point where we understand how amazing we are. 
and how filled this universe is with life. And we're just part of it. And he, and of course I had to interpret because he didn't speak English very well. But I want you to understand, there's Zachariah Sitchin with, uh, with uh, Monsignor Bolducci. I took the photo. The photos, I take them because I'm a photojournalist. So I'm gonna take the photos of the history of this because this dates back for me from 1980. Go ahead, the next one. So these are some of the things that Monsignor Bolducci said. Uh, Catholicism, he said, this is very important. You have to understand this, is based on witness testimony. The whole religion, the apostles and so forth. Why aren't we believing the witnesses to the UFO phenomenon? If we've created a whole religion around witness testimony, he said, See, my talk today is more on logic and ethics. That's logical. All the witness, what do you need? Not only military, which Stephen has filed in, all these military, credible scientists, but there's people out there that have witnessed this phenomena that should also be taken seriously. The next one. There's Steven on the stage in Barcelona, and there is the orb that appeared. Who took that picture? I did. <laughs> uh, I had to because it was a historic conference. Those people were really interested, and most of the people there, except Javier Sierra, who was the, uh, the moderator, were American. And Bob Dean was there. If you remember Robert Dean, he was with us. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so uh, my book, Conversations with Colonel Corso, will give you a um, word by word conversation with what it, with him. In other words, what it is, is all the audio tapes that I took while I was um, working with Corso. But I'm gonna tell you a story about this. Um, I don't know, do we have the Corso clip for, let's, let's play that for them. Because I'll tell you what happened with Colonel Philip Corso. You need to know the real story. Sometimes I feel I am the voice of people who are no longer here. Right today, right. people hear these things. Right. We don't know what the, uh, the humanoid clone, what advancements he can make or how we can make one. So what you have to do, you have to, you can't go to the library and get reference books on how he was built. You can't go any place and find this information. You have to start from zero. It's a new science. I've told you the answer. You have to start from zero and promote a new science. That's what you. Well, we're, that's we're what you people have to do. So and not only that, I tell you, months. I tell you, I'll promote a new science. I'm gonna only give you a little bit of help. You have to do the rest yourselves. And if you can't, you can't carry it on. Colonel, but humans could turn into robots with this new science. How do we so, How do we? You know what? You know what? You know what, you know what Dr. Mari? What I told him, and he agreed. Okay. And my and my own doctor. This would be a great boom for mankind if we could give man new new muscles, new bones, new organs. Do you realize what that would bring to mankind? What? That's what this thing did. Jeez. Medical science is coming. Look at the new advances in medical science that we can make. This man changed my life, and he also changed ufology, and I'll tell you the reason. Um, okay, here's the books uh, in Italian uh, on Colonel Corso, my books in French. Go ahead and, and, and put the. Okay, here is his background. You could read it. The head of intelligence at the age of 28 in Rome, I could verify all that because I dragged him around Rome and he verified everything. Go ahead. Here we are in Rome. Go ahead. This stop here. In 1997 was the 50th anniversary of the Roswell crash. My boss sent me to look for Colonel Philip Corso. He said, the book the day after Roswell came out, Paula, you need to cover this. I was in Italy, I did not want to come. 
I had other things I wanted to do. I didn't know what he looked like. I didn't know what I was supposed to do with him. I got to, but they, there are some people that could drive me there. Once I got here and I got to Roswell, it was a big party. There was all the major UFO people and Colonel Corso was there and I didn't know what he looked like but I went to the uh, where he was having a press conference and a, a blonde man pushed me into the crowd and said, you have to speak to my father in Italian. I said, who are you? And he said, I'm Colonel Corso's son. And I asked Colonel Corso about the Santilli footage, the alien autopsy in Italian. And he answered and he said, that seems real. He said, because that lens now remember little gray aliens that we see that we have these big eyes. He said, that was a lens, he said, and we pull that off. He said, we back in bed engineered night screening devices from it. And he told everybody, Colonel Corso could not speak in this country for the jealousy and the court case against his book. So we promptly pulled him to Italy and he testified on two different occasions in Pescara and the independent uh, uh, Republic of San Marino. Now, when I tell you this, I'm telling you that sometimes our own people stop our own people from testifying because it was very, very interesting that he spoke in Italy. So this is the autopsy of the ETs. And it's in the book, Conversations with Colonel Corso. Now go ahead, keep going, we'll go really fast. Here we are in, in Rome. I brought him to Europe. This is the conversation. He told me that I had to talk about this. And I said, I can't, I can't do this. And he said, you'll learn, you're a soldier. And I'm a woman, I'm going, what do you mean you'll learn? I'm a, I'm a soldier. He said, after I'm gone, you must talk about this. Go ahead. Here we are, go ahead. All right, so from that point of view, I heard that the former defense minister had read Corso's book, had called some um, military man here. And what this man said was, I verify what Corso said about back engineering and more. And when I realized what this was really about, I realized that's what the secret was. It wasn't people were going to panic. This is about uh, creating back engineering. Go ahead. Now, this is the story that Stephen has been talking about. When we uh, detonated the atomic bomb, somebody noticed. So that 1947 Roswell, which has become a party if you go there, was not the first crash. It was 1945, go ahead. It was in San Antonio, New Mexico. Two little boys, Remy Baca and Jose Padilla, were looking for a cow that was calving and that had a calf. And what had happened is, they were, they watched a UFO come in, hit a radio tower and, and actually crash. A piece of it fell off and they saw the beings inside. This is a case I've been covering for the last nine years. It really happened. I believe that the files on this are in the Atomic Energy Commission files and not on the Blue Book files, go ahead. And here's Jose and here's Remy. One is nine, one is six, they're children. They're telling the truth, this really happened. I did an interview for Stephen that you'll see in the, in the um, documentary of the details of this. This is important because it was one month after the atomic bomb. So these ETs, this civilization were not on vacation. This was a statement to planet Earth. The boys saw the creatures. They stayed there for at least 20 to 25 minutes and watched it. Go ahead. Now, why is that important? Because at that time, and there's Oppenheimer, and I heard the, the uh, testimony, I am death, the killer of worlds, which is what uh, that, that Trinity plaque is near, uh, near the site there, 13 miles from where this crash was. I am death. I have created death, the killer of worlds, plural. Oppenheimer is having a conversation with Einstein. Go ahead. 
protocols were discussed, Oppenheimer and Einstein said, we got problems here. You think Oppenheimer that wasn't there didn't know about this crash? It was one month after the atomic bomb, go ahead. There is a document, MJ-12 document. It's called Relationships with Inhabitants of Celestial Bodies. It's an MJ-12 document, there it is. You can go on Ryan Wood's website and read it. And what it says basically, go ahead. What it says is, hey, President Truman, we got problems. We're having visitations because something happened. And this is a month after the atomic bomb. And it says, we've got to do something. The United Nations cannot cover this. We're going to create a supra United Nations. He calls them cosmic cultures. There is no hint of hostility. This document, you should go on Ryan Wood's uh, uh, Woods uh, web website and look at it, relationships with celestial bodies, and it calls them cultures. And in the UFO field, all you see is a little gray alien. We've got to understand that there were also people from other planets coming here. They, in fact, Colonel Corson said, we weren't worried about the clone. We were worried about who created them. Because those things can fly in outer space, but there are actual you know, cultures that created them. Go ahead. This is uh, Adamski, and it's very important because people, my colleagues especially, just completely, completely canceled George Adamski. When I started listening to his uh, audio tapes, Adamski was addressing all world leaders because in 1952, November 20th, 1952, the message from Orthon, and there's his footprints done by George Hunt Williamson, Williamson plaster casts of his shoes. If you would go back to the uh, Dembski era, we were on a timeline like we are today where Dembski said, look, Orthon that came off the ship said, this planet is run on a war economy. And if you keep doing this, you have to create the wars. But Kennedy wanted to go out into outer space. Orthon says, look, if you guys change the war economy to a space economy. The, the spinoffs from the space economy will give you enough money to still have an economy, but you'll get to meet us. That is the message of George Adamski. If you bother, go back and do some scholarly study of ufology. Get, get his audio tapes. He went to the queen of Denmark, to the queen of England, all over the world. And the irony is when I went to speak to people that knew him, the ETs would go in the car with him. The ones that look like us. And it's very, very interesting, go ahead. Okay, so the message of George, that's the message written. We'd have to create the wars. Well, guess what we chose? We, we're, out of, we're out of enemies, so <laughs> I don't know. Now we have to go into something else. Okay, go ahead. There is Colonel Korsko speaking to Desmond Leslie, who wrote the books on Adamski. I was listening to the conversations. I'd sit there at dinner and listen to Desmond Leslie go, uh, you know, uh, on about meeting George Adamski and what he said. Go ahead. There I am with Dr. Edgar Mitchell. It's time to tell the truth, said. We are not alone and they are not hostile, and, or we would have conflicts a long time ago. Look, if they were going to bomb us, they would have bombed us. Or if they were going to attack us, they would have attacked us when we became a threat. Why are they going to do it in 2021? So all at once in 2021, we become a threat and we see all this. Now, there's an agenda behind everything. God bless Edgar Mitchell because he was, like you guys, a hero. And because it cost him a lot to come out and uh, talk about UFOs, but basically he had an epiphany when he was in outer space and felt the consciousness rise. Go ahead. There's Edgar Mitchell and me and Roswell, go ahead. Now, here we go. Dar uh, Clifford Stone just died February 12th. And I, I had his book published, but Clifford Stone has a message for you. He did 12 crash retrievals three of them in Vietnam. Uh, his first crash retrieval, he didn't know it. I can't go into detail about this, but when he was picked to do this, he was 
18 years old. His first crash retrieval was in Indian Town Gap, Indiana in 1969. He had courage enough to speak at your disclosure conference. And the agenda for Colonel Corso were his, was his three grandsons. He wanted them to know that it was real. He, it was not about making money, doing Roswell books or whatever. His agenda was that his son was killed. He had twin sons. His son, Robert, was killed. That was the impetus to come forward at, the, at your disclosure project. And the, just these heroes have an agenda for the um, knowledge of mankind. The agenda of today is not that. Go ahead. And he just died. And he said he had a, a first aid manual with 57 different species in it. And guess what? Our field has reptilians, greys, and, and Nordics. And we got 57 different species. And so we play the reptilians, greys, and Nordics, and we try to shove. There are cosmic cultures out there that are interested in coming here to watch the evolution of mankind. And they are not reptilians, greys, and Nordics. Go ahead. This is, and this is Wilbur Smith, who said that this subject matter, the, the, the visitation to the earth is classified higher than the atomic bomb. Go ahead. So we're getting to the end. Why would I ever do this? I started as nuts and bolts with Alan Heine putting pins in, in, uh, in maps for sightings. And it took me this long to look at what, why this was happening. This is a phenomena that is created. Go ahead, the next one. This is a phenomenon that is created to raise the level of consciousness of this planet because if we don't grow up, the repercussions are horrible. Go ahead. Here's Colonel Corso and me in Europe. He had a piece of metal with atoms aligned. He only spoke in Europe. What happened here? Our own people, two, great, two researchers went after him. So he could not speak it. Go ahead. There's, there we are. And he said, I had a bunch of fiber optics. Okay, the next one. Paul Hellyer, former defense minister. Everybody laughed at him, but he felt he needed to talk. He is not somebody off the street. And there's Al Gore, and Carol talked about ecology, and he had courage to talk about, you know, an inconvenient truth. Go ahead. And there they are. The release of these technologies could change the planet. This isn't just about UFO disclosure. This is about changing the order of the planet. In other words, if these technologies were released, if we could learn to not look at the borders, you know, we are looking at the United States, China, Russia. When Edgar Mitchell was in outer space, his famous quote that I love is he grabbed, uh, he, he said, I'm going to grab one of those Congress people. He said, I see the little beautiful blue circle that's the planet say, hey, you son of a bitch, where are the borders there? This is a quote from Edgar Mitchell, astronaut, Apollo 14. There are no borders to fight for. There is no, it, humanity is humanity. I'm Italian, but I'm human first. And I think we've got to do something here. We've got to redefine humanity. We are humans. We all have children. We all want this planet to survive. For me, the message is, this is it. Okay, the next one, this, we have a problem. Steven just did two hours of this, our stuff or their stuff. Go ahead. And then the message from Warthon was that we could go to a space-based economy instead of a war economy, the next one. So when Colonel Corso had his encounter in the desert, Colonel Corso told me, this is the first interview you gave me. And I said, I'm not printing this. They're gonna think you're nuts. I can't do it. He told me that he had an encounter in the desert with a being because a craft had landed. He had seen it from the sky. This being came out of a, a, a cave in, um, in White Sands. And Colonel Corso being Italian, he had a stiletto in his, uh, in his boot, but he had a gun and he pointed it at the being and he said, friend or foe. And he said, Paula, guess what he said? I said, he said, neither. He said, neither. 
there are no good aliens or bad aliens. Like there are no good people or bad people. They just are. But look at the agendas. And then Colonel Cor the being said, do you want to come aboard? And Colonel Corso said, what do you have to offer me? <laughs> A new world if you could take it. The last words of the CE5 movie. A new world if you can take it to me is not a hostile statement. And I bless you for putting that in your CE5 movie because that being knew we were gonna do this today. He knew, do you understand? There is no time. So whatever you're doing today, that being knew you were gonna do it. Okay, go ahead. He said, Paula, a new world will dawn for you and you will be in the forefront. This is Colonel Philip Corso. I didn't know what he was talking about because I've learned so much since then. Go ahead, the next one. I leave you with a question. When any, what you think disclosure comes out, look where it comes out from and look what the agenda is. Please use your brains. Please use logic. And then maybe we can get through this together. And I thank you so much. <laughs> And we'll be having more information coming up. Oh, somebody left their hand. Right here? Oh. Um, so we'll be having uh, more information about this uh, case in 1945. We did an extensive interview uh, on that. And one of the things that was an interesting correlation is that those uh, children picked up uh, just bags of these angel hair like filaments that they decorated their. Christmas trees, and then the whole town got them, and it turned out they were fiber optics. And of course, Corner Perso talks about the fact that uh, in the in the 1947 crash and others, they had retrieved these uh, filaments. You put a light at one end, it would transmit it. So, so much of the technology, interestingly, that's information systems have come out. What have they held back? The things that need to save the planet, energy, propulsion, Instead of these advanced sciences, we're using oil, gas, coal, nuclear power, which should have been retired a hundred years ago, what I call the lost century. 